if you look at this for a design that is that simple, um, it makes a lot of sense to maybe do it this way. We don't have any other dependency. There's no JavaScript involved. It's pretty straightforward. Um, but let's say we wanted to just make it a little um, less tedious so we don't have to create these secondary classes. Um, let's take advantage of JavaScript if it's supported. So this, we could just have it um, as a backup and we could just maybe put it into a no script tag and that will call it. So that's, that's, that will be a fallback. But for now, let's assume that uh, the presentation layer has JavaScript, the browser supports JavaScript. How would we go about that? So let's go into our main JS and uh, go ahead and start a quick module here. We will be passing document to this module. And here, document will be passed into this function. So what I'm going to do is basically, I want to capture all these bars that are on the page. So a way, a way to go about it might be doing this. And I want it to be an array since I want to be able to iterate over it. But there's many type of selectors I could be using. One that I like a lot is the document query selector all. The only caveat with that one is it gives me an array like object, but it's not a true array. So for example, if I was to get the length on it or to try to iterate over it, it will fail. So the one trick that you can do is declare uh, this variable as an array use the slice method on it and then pass in what you're going to be getting from the document um, giving it context via call and basically using the document query selector all of course if you have something like jquery it becomes very easy but just for the sake of speed let's just go with regular javascript and what are we targeting every class or every element that has the bar in a class. So now we have all the bars that are on the page contained in this object. So we're going to go ahead and iterate through them. We could use a for loop or for each, but I like the conciseness of uh, the JavaScript map function. Um, so basically the syntax is pretty simple. You have a callback and inside that callback, you're going to have, um, each iteration of the object. So I will call it bar and you can even have the index of that. So next, since I have this bar object, this bar here that is targeting, um, each of this, um, uh, elements. I'm going to go ahead and add a style to it just by using the style um, attribute on it and the style object on it and then targeting the width rule. What is going to be the width value? It is going to be same thing again, the bar that is here, which is our DOM element. And this time we're going to target a data set. So anytime you have attributes, uh, data attributes, this can be captured in JavaScript by this uh, data set object. So let's go back to main. And then what is the key that we're looking for? It's called percent. So basically we say, go to this for each of the bars that are on the page, go ahead, add um, um, a new style that is going to be uh, the width uh, and uh, the value of it would be the data uh, percent that is in there uh, via this syntax. That is pretty powerful. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's make sure that in our CSS um, bar inner is at width 0%. So technically, 
if we don't have JavaScript involved, let's go into the JavaScript and just comment out this. In the browser, we should not be seeing the inner bars. Okay. Let's go ahead and uncomment it. And there you go. So now this um, width is taken care of by JavaScript, looking at the attributes that are like on the element. So one final thing that we can do is um, add a little bit of an animation between uh, when the first one comes out, or we can make sure that it kind of smoothly animate. So what we're going to do here, let's go back to the CSS first and um, add a transition rule. So basically what we can do with CSS nowadays is for any element, we can listen on a change um, of the behavior of the color or anything like that. And when we capture that, we can go ahead and have an animation uh, around that. So the way to do that is um, we're going to use a prefix here goes WebKit. Um, I believe the support for transition is there, but just to be safe, I'm going to use a vendor prefix. And basically, I'm going to listen to the width change that JavaScript is going to uh, make happen. So width, I want the transition to be, let's say, to be smooth. Let's go with um, three seconds, which is 3000 milliseconds here. And since it's just a bar, I can go with the default linear. And that should pretty much do it. And one more thing here. This is just for the particular WebKit browser, but for all the browsers that might already support it, you can go ahead and um, let's say we can add the Mozilla one here and we can do the same for without any vendor prefix. So all of those three basically depending on the browser you're looking at. I believe for IE that's um, MS in front of it uh, but I will have to double check on that. But basically we're saying to the WebKit to the to the um, to via CSS Anytime the width is going to change on this, go ahead and make sure that this transition happens. And um, it to make sure it takes, this is the duration time, make sure it takes three seconds for that, um, for that animation to complete. So let's go ahead and refresh. And you can see that nothing is happening here. And that's... Um, that's a little challenging in JavaScript uh, sometimes when you want to take care of some of the animation because it uh, it did not resist the um, the long story short is we can tell JavaScript to register that change. So that's not a very good explanation about it, but uh, maybe the code will give you some enlightenment about it. So the way that I can tell JavaScript to kind of force the issue is using the set timeout. What the set timeout is going to do, it's basically going to make the browser understand that I need to add something uh, to the event loop. So uh, let's go ahead um, and add a quick set timeout here, which is a nice way of in JavaScript to add a timer. And just to show that we're just adding um, to the event loop, let me make the timing function equal to zero and then add our earlier code here. Inside of that timer now. So let's go ahead and refresh this. Very nice. We see it like happening. Um, it takes three seconds for each of them. I mean, one way to verify that and the CSS is controlling that we would maybe just change to 1000 here, which is one second, which will make this go a little faster. 
as you can see. Now, what if I wanted to have some of a kind of a cascading, uh, this one going first, then this one, then this one, then the other one. So what I can do is, um, uh, let me go back to 3000. What I can do in the JS file, since I have access to this index uh, value, I'll go ahead and take that and basically say every single second, go ahead and animate um, the current um, index that you are on. So for the first one, the index starting at zero, it will go ahead almost right away. The second one will be index one times 1000, that will be 1000 millisecond. The second one will be 2000, 3000, and so forth and so on. So let's go ahead and see what that effect looks like. Pretty nice. So there's in a nutshell, basically like how uh, one might go about addressing something like this. Um, adding a few animation to make it very nice. Um, uh, mostly the logic is in our CSS and uh, JavaScript can be here to the rescue to, to add a little more effect here and there. So that's all I had for today. Uh, this was a CSS skills graph. Uh, this is Eddie from the Coders for Africa Online Academy. Until next time.